Welcome to part two of Visions of the 21st Century, where the expanding fields of knowledge are further examined. We extend our inquiry through the life sciences and social sciences, concluding that the modern world materialistic view is the dominant methodology in almost all fields of knowledge. There are some interesting exceptions, for example, in parts of cosmology. Naturally, there have been reactions against this materialist worldview, but these are usually on the sidelines or in more esoteric fields. Although these knowledge systems have advanced the material human condition, they have also contributed significantly to the problems of the 21st century. Welcome to part two of Visions of the 21st Century. Life sciences, um, Darwin's theory of evolution of course, has received increasing uh, support um, and a dominant theory in the life sciences. Uh, it's been united in the, the, the grand synthesis with Mendel's discovery of genetics, the great Czech monk, and also with the DNA discoveries in the 50s and 60s, Crick and Watson in Britain, um, who basically um, provided the basis for understanding the structure of DNA and the, and the human genome was now being cracked, as well as the Neanderthal genome and lots of animals' genomes, uh, from, for which the 21st century is going to be transformed by our knowledge of the genome, we, we think. So the life sciences look solidly in the, in the materialist worldview, don't they? That's by materialist analysis, Darwin's theory of evolution, Mendel's theory of genetics, the Darwinian, uh, the um, uh, theory of the DNA, it's all solidly materialistic, whether you know, the material world, induction, logic, hypotheses, materialistic units, even the tiny small chromosomes below that genes, these are the determinants of the life system. Right, so it seems a triumph for the modern worldview, doesn't it? However, there's lots of problems in it. Uh, it's not quite like physics where a, a new expanding alternative worldview seems possible, but there's something called facilitated evolution which you may come across, which is that there's lots of people who have proposed that the, the, the big leaps in evolution cannot be explained by this the synthesis theory. That the leaps are so fast and so intricate that there's no way the, the gene pools could have accounted for it with their mutational changes, which although they can be fast, are a lot slower than what is required to account for these sudden punctuated equilibria, they're called, these sudden new leaps in evolution where you suddenly move into a human consciousness or the development of a wing suddenly comes very fast. The traditional theory of Darwin's theory is that everything develops very slowly by genetic mutation, bit by bit. It's a slow process, organised, ordered process. But increasing amounts of evidence are saying, no, evolution makes these sudden leaps. And this is more facilitated by view of systems theory, isn't it? Systems theory, Capra, remember? And lots of others in the 20th century, but Capra seemed to sum this up, and said that you get these what's called emergent effects in the life process and in physics and in, 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 in social sciences, by which you get these sudden leaps which become possible as a result of some kind of build-up which you can't see and it's below the surface and suddenly create new forms and they're called em 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 these emergent effects. Okay. The, so there are even things in biology, it's things at the side where we're thinking, hmm, this sounds very like what Wallace, remember Wallace and Darwin? They, they discovered evolution together and they decided to publish together, but Darwin had been doing it long before and he got the prize, so to speak. But Wallace was also out in, the, in the Indonesia and he was doing his research and actually got his letter to Darwin explaining natural selection before Darwin had published. So he's a brilliant young man. And he believed towards the end, uh, in, the, in his midlife, and wrote to Darwin that he believed that the natural selection theory of Darwin was not quite sufficient to explain the great variety and of, of evolution. And Darwin wrote to back to him saying, do not abandon our method, do not abandon the scientific method. It's a materialistic method. Um, please have your head screwed on, you're getting carried away there in the jungles of Indonesia. Um, um, please keep your scientific head on, like Freud said to Jung. You know, don't abandon our, our, our canon, our materialistic method, and give in to superstition. So, um, uh, but Wallace and Henri Bergson and so on, uh, Ilan Vital, have all suggested that there is something else operating in evolution which is um, remarkable and which can't quite be explained by the modern worldview. Other fields of knowledge, the evolution of our species, you would think that the evolution of human beings, we would find lots of things that, as it were, support the alternative worldview, wouldn't you? After all, 
you know, how have human beings developed their consciousness and so on. But if you look at the field of the evolution of our species, basically it's been dominated by the materialist worldview and the alternative view of something more spiritual or something more the mystery of consciousness has largely gone unexplored in this field. It's mostly explained according to the, evolu the, the evolutionists um, by, well, our consciousness developed as a result of random mutation. This is their usual answer. There were genetic random mutations between the Neanderthals and us. So basically, that it's still dominated by the materialist worldview. Ecology is an exception because the ecology is dominated by a crisis, isn't it? The field of ecology. We have scientific ecology dominated by the material worldview, and we have deep ecology, which says no, there's a crisis in our world system, and that we have to be aware of our consciousness doing this to the planet. Um, we have been responsible for this and we are deeply immersed in our ecology. We're not separate human beings from it, uh, from the rest of creation, from the rest of evolution, sorry. System's view of life, instead of looking at an individual component on the elephant, is trying to look at the total system. Uh, process theory, of course Whitehead has suggested this in the early 20th century that you've got to look at things as processes and not as nuts and bolts and bits and pieces to be analysed and put together separately. That the whole thing is a process system and is a world of flux and change. So we do have philosophers in the 20th century who I anticipate will have increasing influence. Whitehead at the beginning of the 20th century is just an ex one example, there's lots of others. Um, and Capra towards the, uh, at the beginning of the 21st century their views of process and change and being part of a larger system are all part, of inevitably, of a greater view which we must incorporate and I anticipate will increasingly challenge the materialist worldview. And indeed, we're realising that the centre of this view is the human being and that we have lots of study of the right hand now and the left, hand, left hemispheres, the right hemispheres of the brain, which show exactly this dichotomy. The left-hand side of our brain, as we now know, uh, tends to look at things analytically, materialistically, tends to break things down. And so it, it's ideally suited to the modern worldview and the scientific method, isn't it? We would expect, therefore, that in those parts of the world where the modern worldview and scientific method are dominant, that there'll be a dominance of the left-hand side of the brain. People think more analytically, more logically, uh, more rationally, more coldly, less emotionally, less intuitively, and so on. And indeed, I think that's broadly what we find if you look at our educational systems. There's only very few parts of our educational system which encourage the, right, encourage the right hemisphere point of view. The right hemisphere is more, slightly more emotional, but it's certainly more intuitive, and it certainly looks at the context of things, the gestalt of things, a lot more, doesn't it? And it's, we now know it's this balance between the right and the left hemisphere. As Jung would have said, the conscious and the unconscious. It's, to my mind, a development of what Jung was talking about anyway, and depth psychology. That this unity of ourselves, which is essentially what we're looking for, this integration, is vital. And that systems view and process theory, uh, which will gain force in this alternative worldview, uh, will unite with the materialist worldview to provide another synthesis in the 21st century, instead of being separate and opposing camps. That's my belief. Other fields, history, economics, psychotherapy, neuroscience, I could go on and on, but just take two that I know something about to wrap this up. Um, economics has huge gaps in its systems analysis. It generally does not look at how it integrates with ecology, for example, and its destruction for the planet. It generally does not look at how human beings destroy um, other societies. It doesn't take account of externalities, external costs. It doesn't take account of the um, uh, huge indirect costs which are caused by modern industrial systems and their impact upon nature. It doesn't count those costs. It counts things in a very narrow analytic and materialist manner, uh, accountancy manner. And even despite the crisis of 2008 and despite the, um, uh, the ecology crisis that we all know is happening in front of us, the economics is, is, is the last to change in these matters and, and they have a lot to answer for. Psychotherapy has also been dominated by this dichotomy between the modern and the uh, worldview and the alternative worldview. The modern worldview, you could say, was represented by Freud, modernism, scientific method. 
um, looking at the human beings and discovering the unconscious, an amazing discovery, but then saying it's explained materialistically really. It's explained by for Freud, sexual and aggressive forces, uh, instinctual forces from the psyche are ex explaining what's going on. And certainly that'll take you some distance, and certainly you find some evidence for that. Of course, we, we, you know, we come from the world of, of creatures and animals and we've evolved. But uh, Jung represents the, um, the alternative worldview, a worldview which actually believes in some unity of the psychotherapist and the client, or uh, between mankind and nature, um, which looks at the scientific method, is able to use it, but at the same time, moves to the realm of what I'm just going to summarize his alchemy and his Gnosticism and uh, all the other things, of the alternative things that he developed and pioneered and has given to us as tremendous gifts as his, um, as the transpersonal. Transpersonal is now a big word, but that actual word originated with Jung. The transpersonal, there's, never, there's part of the human psyche which is transpersonally linked. That vision of Jung has just gained in force by those areas of psychotherapy and neuroscience and so on which see the human being increasingly as having this dimension, not just an instinctual dimension, not just an emotional dimension or a conscious dimension or an unconscious explained by our instincts dimension, but higher dimensions which reach the transpersonal in which the distinction between ourselves and the nature and ourselves and the other breaks down just as it breaks down in physics, that distinction between ourselves and the electron or the particle um, breaks down as two separate entities. And the idea of entanglement and unity and uh, uh, this participation mystique, as we've called it, this unity with the world becomes evident. So psychotherapy belong, you know, has this problem also. There's a great deal of it, like psychology, dominated by the modern worldview. Proper diagnosis, proper clinical practices, separation between client and, 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 and analyst, um, uh, looking at things analytically, verbally, trying to understand the source of things. It's a uh, modern worldview, isn't it? Modern, it's, it's, it's modern science. But then, when you ex do explore that, as I've had to, you run up against the limits of, of its healing capacity, of its capacity for change in the personality. You get a certain distance with that worldview, but then in, uh, in the psyche you, you rapidly come across parts of it which cannot be explained by the modern, uh, modern worldview. You have to use another set of tools. And that's why I wrote Healing Intelligence, because I, I began to rea realise that the healing that takes place and that most people are seeking can only be achieved by other methods rather than the analytical method. You have to use something else. And you have to put yourself in there in some way, otherwise it doesn't work. And so I began to become fascinated by this healing intelligence and this mystery of what we can, I'm just going to summarise the alternative worldview. I could go on about that of course, but um, I'm going to leave that and just finally end with that neuroscience. And of course a, a lot of you read and were inspired by the McGilchrist, which looks at this two sides of ourselves, where we can see this division between materialism and idealism World, the, the different worldviews, analytic versus the intuitive and the spiritual, played out in the different sides of our brain. So what we're doing in the world in terms of our consciousness is ultimately reflected in ourselves, the observer, who is looking out at the world. We and the elephant are the same. Or as the Hindu said, you know, Brahman is ultimately Atman. Our individual souls are ultimately part of the great cosmos. We could go on, but we haven't got time. So, um, reactions against the modern worldview, of course, all the world's religions, the perennial philosophy, the wisdom traditions. Um, perennial philosophy is basically, across the ages, those philosophies and, and cults, religions and so on, which believe there's some underlying reality underneath our phenomenal world, which is quite different from what we imagine and what we analyse. The Romantics, Blake in particular, much of classical music, Kabbalah, Gnostics, alchemy, Sufism, the rebirth of the soul, etc. All, of course, have strong reactions against the modern worldview. The status of the modern worldview, however, is that it is dominant in most disciplines, however, it will be increasingly challenged. And indeed, as the conditions underlying the modern worldview change, 
ecology, economics, and the crisis of the 21st century, increasing numbers of people will look at the modern worldview and saying, this is precisely what has advanced us to a certain extent, but also got us into deep trouble.